Well, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow members, a year ago, when I was giving a first President's Lecture, I raised some questions about the origin, history, traditions, and justification for the President's Lecture. I, am, I have some of the answer. The answer is 1948, and I'll explain the rest of the answer later on. What I want to do is review something of the history of the Institute through the medium of looking at its presidents. And I think I can see at least four previous presidents in the audience, which makes up two thirds of my existing predecessors, surviving predecessors. Um, so let me say at the outset that I'm not gonna say much about the more recent presidents individually. <laughs> we should treat them as a group not because they have made less contribution, but because they're nearer to modern memory. We know many of them. We know what they did. Uh, and by that point, the history of presidency has settled down into a pattern. Um, I look in rather more detail at some of the earlier people who filled the post. But I want to, want to use this as a means of looking at the institution itself and its history and its evolution and in particular to look at how it evolved as the nature of archaeology evolved over the last 170 years or so. Quite a lot's been written about the early days of the Institute, in particular 1844 and 1845, and its notorious split from what became the British Archaeological Association. I'm not going to say very much about that, but what I want to look at is something that hasn't been talked about very much in the literature, and that is the later development of the society as the nature of archaeology changed in the 19th and early 20th century. And in particular, to see how successfully the Institute has adapted to changing circumstances. There is, of course, a slight sting in the tail in that if you take that by, there is an obvious message for the present context. Uh, a good place to start would be with the formation of what was then the Archaeological in Association in 1844 before it split. And it was largely the work of Magdalene Albert Way, who was at the same time director of the Society of Antiquaries and one of the secretaries of the Archaeological Association and the leader of the faction that set up the Archaeological Institute when it split in early 1845. In the first volume of the Archaeological Journal, when it split, we, the Institute, inherited the Archaeological Journal as a title and a publication, but not the name. The Archaeological Association called itself the British Archaeological Association, and we christened ourselves the Institute. So we got the journal, but not the title. In the first, first volume, Way wrote an introduction, which was a sort of justification for the existence of the foundation and the existence of the Institute. And it says a little bit about the nature of archaeology at the time, in 1844. Um, the love and study of ancient historical monuments had become a national taste. Monuments themselves gradually disappear. And what, um, what, what, you, what we had to bear in mind is the political and economic context at the time of the, 18, in the late 1830s and 1840s when the plans were being put in place to set up the Institute, a time of considerable political, economic, and ecclesiastical debate, if not upheaval or even potentially revolution. One of the key things was a growing awareness of the importance of the physical evidence of archaeology. And that's what I think Way means, the love and study of ancient and historical monuments have become a national taste. And it's interesting to look at the broader context. In 1841, a select committee of the House of Commons met to consider the state of the national monuments. Now, if you read their report, it's a fascinating document, because what they started out considering as national monuments were effectively the funerary memorials of the great and the good, such as those in the crypt of St. Paul's. And there was a lot of comment about what, how they were in a bad state. 
and whether it was due to the riffraff being allowed in to see them, um, or whether they, they should be fenced off and only allowed to the, the, the appropriate sort of people to see them, or alternatively, they should be opened up to a wider public. But you can see the, case, the question of a national monument being debated, and it gets really interesting when you get... The, the, the Select Committee operated by a means of question and answer. They had a large number of witnesses. The questions and the answers given are recorded. When you get to question 1,947, the, the person being questioned is the, the architectural historian and illustrator, John Britton, who says, well, look, um, what do you mean by national monument? Something like a Roman villa or a historic house can tell us just, amount, just as much about the history of the nation as one of these funerary monuments. And the whole concept of a monument as something more than a funerary memorial, but evidence for the past is being crystallized. Quite a lot is due to what was happening in France at the time, and Britain was particularly well informed about the processes of, of monument preservation in France, which was years ahead of us. Um, a year or two later, 1845, a, a, a motion, a bill was introduced into Parliament <coughs> proposing a museum for national antiquities and a commission for the conservation of national monuments. Um, predictably, it got absolutely nowhere. But at that time, British museums also being widely criticised for not displaying or collecting any British antiquities. This was all about to change fairly soon. So the rising interest, as represented by the Foundation Institute, represents a growing recognition of the importance of some of the things, or some of the evidence, and the threat to it. Economically, the second part of Wei's comment here, economically, it was a time of massive economic upheaval, industrial revolution in full swing, and all sorts of forms of destruction. The progress of public works, such as railways, sewers, or buildings, not only destroyed the archaeology, but presented opportunities. It's a sort of classic statement of the development of lead archaeology and the need to preserve things as they're destroyed. Uh, but um, about 150 years ahead of any effective response to the problem um, in, in Britain. Politically, there are other things afoot. 1832 had seen the passing of the Great Reform Act, one of the major steps in curtailing aristocratic control of Parliament. In 1837, Queen Victoria came to the throne. Her subsequent coronation was marked by the termination of a whole series of medieval ceremonies, which deprived the aristocracy of some of their roles in formal ceremony and was seen as an insult to them and an infringement of their traditional rights. Same in 1838, the first People's Charter, leading to the programme of Chartism, which dared to demand such revolutionary things as adult male suffrage and annually elected parliaments. All of this led to fear for the survival of institutions of aristocracy, even the survival of royalty. And ecclesiastically, Oxford movement, in Oxford promoting return to traditional values. In, in Cambridge, the Cambridge Camden Society, which led to transform itself into the Ecclesiological Society, was busy promoting the study of Gothic architecture as the appropriate mode for modern church building. And proposals for the disestablishment of the church in Ireland led to widespread fears about the threat, not just to aristocracy and royalty, but also to the, the powers of the church. These threats were not totally isolated from archaeological concerns. They were also political. Way refers here to loss of the monuments either by decay of time, wanton destruction. What was he thinking of? Well, the most spectacular loss of an ancient monument or a historic building in recent years had obviously been the fire that destroyed the Palace of Westminster in 1834. Um, at first, it was thought this might be the result of something like the gunpowder plot, and yet another um, revolt against the aristocracy and parliament. But it soon became clear that it was causing incompetence rather than plot. But that didn't stop. There were widespread stories about the people of London turning out to watch. Not just to watch, but to cheer. 
but it wasn't an act of wanton destruction. It was an injury suffered without ill intention in Way's words. But there were more certainly spe more specifically political acts which he may have had in mind. In 1831, the first attempt to pass the Great Reform Bill had failed due to the reaction in the House of Lords of an extreme right-wing group of conservative Tory and, and Lords, and in particular the bishops. This resulted in widespread rioting in October 1831, and the loss of the bishop's palace, along with the jail and larger parts of the city of Bristol, closely followed by Nottingham Cross, the residence of the Duke of Newcastle, one of the right-wing opponents of reform. Um, he was so right-wing, even the Duke of Wellington thought him a bit extreme. <laughs> but again, this drawing seems to suggest that down by uh, the waterside, uh, the citizens of Nottingham were dancing and celebrating as the Duke of Newcastle's house went up in flames. So to go back to Way, I'm sorry to inflict this slab of Victorian text on you, but it, I've simplified it a little bit. Um, the, the important bit begins in the middle. But res respect for the great institutions of this country, sacred and secular, and a lively interest in their maintenance must be increased in proportion to the intelligent appreciation of monuments. In other words, the study of archaeology is designed to improve your respect, appreciation, and admiration for the secular powers of the aristocracy and the ecclesiastical powers of the bishop, rather than burning down their houses. Archaeology has a message of political education and support for the existing power structure. Some people have described a split in 1845 that led to the Association Institute of separate organisations as more or less a dispute over printing or over per a clash of personalities. Um, I think it's difficult to deny that there's, a lot, there's very much a political element here. The Institute had a largely aristocratic support, whereas the people who were described as the tradesmen, people like Rich Smith and Thomas Wright, went in the other faction and formed the British Archaeological Association. It was at least a partly a political split about the function of archaeology and the function of the archaeological organisation. Once, we have, once the split is in place and Way is effectively the organising genius, we can begin to see what his idea was. The Institute was to have a central committee which was made up of people living in London, largely because they could meet regularly. And they would process information and publish it through a journal. The other major element was an annual meeting which was to be held in a series of historic towns around the country, each year moving to a different place. So we started Canterbury in 1844, Winchester in 1845, York in 1846, um, going around the major historic cathedral towns and cities of the country in turn. What was the role of the president? Well, first of all, there wasn't much to preside over. The secretary and the, the secretaries of the organisation did all the work. The president was needed to preside at the annual meeting. And Way's idea was in order to promote the ideas of archaeology and the respect for ancient monuments in the provinces, you would move from place to place and your president would be a local bigwig who would be um, representing local authority and preside over the meeting to, as a public relation, but also as a political gesture. And so we start with a series of local aristocrats or, or local landowners who are invited for one year to preside over the annual meeting, but don't really seem to have any other function. So, um, so in Canterbury in 1844, um, Lord, let's do the Honourable Albert Cunningham local diplomat, politician, former MP for Canterbury. He resigned in 1845, I think largely out of sheer frustration at the bickering that led to the split in the next month. Uh, but he did later return as a vice president of the RAI, by which time he was known as Lord Lonsborough. 
but therefore less than what he was doing what he was meant to do a local aristocrat who was presided over the Canterbury meeting but also incidentally as a local landowner invited members of the institute to come and uh, the sort of the association as it then was uh, to come and dig Saxon barrows on his estate east of Canterbury after the split you had, they had no president huge argument about which half had the right to appoint a president but um, in the end um, de facto the institute found itself a new president Spencer Compton second Martin of Northampton um, cousin of the only assassinated prime minister um, Spencer Percival he, he became an MP for Northampton then de devoted himself to the support of scientific and artistic endeavours and became president of a number of organisations seems to have had a particular interest in geology um, one of the things I'll be pointing out is the sort of the unique aspects of the various presidents the person who served longest or the person who served most often um, Northampton's main claim to fame is probably he is the only president to have a species of dinosaur named after him um, Regnosaurus Northamptoni <laughs> this is the man but he again was only intended to work for he, he took up a, a, a bit of time then did a year from the Winchester meeting in 1845 onwards but very interesting comments he made in his uh, president did make an opening address to the congress in Winchester at this point and he insisted that the meeting was not polemical not political the scientists might, dis might if they please discuss the wars of the roses but with the wars of the 19th century, they had nothing whatever to do. The mere fact that he had to suggest that, suggest that actually the Winchester meeting was highly political and had a lot of ecclesiastical debates about uh, the relevance of Gothic architecture, as well as um, more political debates about um, the, the, the role of the aristocracy. Then we move to a series of other, the exactly the same type of president. Uh, Charles Wentworth, Earl of um, the owner of the largest private house in England, Wentworth Woodhouse. Again, the sort of person who devoted himself to being president of learned societies, and again did one year for us. I should at this point say that um, it's sometimes a little bit difficult to interpret the records um, of the Institute. There's a, a, a lack of clarity about the terminology. Sometimes the people who are presiding are referred to as the patron. It's not, but as far as one can tell from the records, these people were identified as president of the institute for its meeting, which was its main official function. The only other thing they had to do, apart from preside at their local meeting, seems to be they were required or expected or it was hoped that they would turn up at the next meeting in some other city to introduce their successor. Now, Fairly predictably, this became more of an expectation than reality. Um, we moved to Norwich, uh, Edward Stanley, who just happened to be Albert Way's uncle, um, Lincoln, and then we moved to Lord Brownlow pleaded illness and was unable to turn up to introduce his successor in Salisbury, who was um, Sidney the younger son of the um, Earl of Pembroke of Wilton House. When it came to Herbert being at the next meeting in 1850, he communicated it was simply impractical for him to leave home. He was a fairly busy politician, yes. And he was replaced by Spencer Compton again, coming back for the second time and holding office for um, six months or so in the second half of 1850. Now, an interesting sign of the times, which we'll come back to again in a moment, he had been president of the Royal Society but resigned in protest at the Society admitting too many people who were professional scientists. When he, um, when he died he was replaced by a very interesting man, James Talbot, fourth Baron Talbot of Malahide, a member of a, an Irish landowning family, a politician, liberal persuasion, in Palmerston's government eventually. And he, he actually seems to have had some serious interest in archaeology. He was a collector of antiquities and he has actually a list of publications of some significance in Irish and British archaeology. 
but he held office simply for the residue of um, com um, his predecessor's period of office, elected as president simply to fill out after the death of Northampton until the next meeting. He introduced John Han Harford, who was the owner of Blaise Castle, now Blaise Castle Museum, just outside Bristol, where their main museum and art gallery. He was a patron, a collector, and a fairly insignificant artist, painter. But I think the Institute was perhaps a bit lucky in getting some people who had at least some interest in archaeology. Um, Marcus of Northampton was in fact a collector, had a very significant collection of Greek and classical antiquities until it was eventually sold off by one of his descendants in the 1920s. Then it looks as though they have a change of a plan. The annual succession of presidents who don't bother to turn up at the next meeting um, and do very little. There's almost no record of these presidents doing anything else other than presiding over one event. Talbot comes back for a second term and he presides for nine years. Next change is that the presidency becomes not an annual event but three years. They seem to be moving towards um, what I suppose we would now call strong and stable government with a president <laughs> who will actually do something because he, and it, at this point they are all he, um, because he will be and knows he will be in place for three years. And Talbot began actually to preside over meetings in London as well. He's becoming more active. More is expected of the president. So, sorry, go, um, Talbot Malahide goes on until, does three terms of office until 1862, and then seems to have a change of mind. He seems to want to try to revert to the old practice of having a local aristocrat in place. And he put um, a meeting in Worcester. They go to George Littleton, fourth Baron Littleton, um, owner of Hagley House, which I'm sure some people know, another huge grade one listed building, Tory Bond. He's probably the only president who, in his presidential address, proudly professed total ignorance of all archaeological and antiquarian matters. <laughs> This seems, again, seems to have been enough to convince the, the Institute that the annual system of local bigwigs was just not really an effective means of managing a modern organisation. So, in 1863, you have a reform of the presidency, which in some ways seems to be an attempt to get the best of both worlds. You have a, a president elected, not for three, but just for now for one year, but eligible for immediate re-election, which he didn't have what happened to most of them. But a new role was created, and it's called president of the meeting. Sometimes called president of the local meeting, sometimes called president of the annual meeting. But the, this continues the tradition of a local worthy being invited to preside over the annual meeting at wherever it is outside London. And that is specifically one function, preside over the meeting, one year, nothing else. And the person re-elected, or the person elected, George Pratt, Marcus Camden. Um, again, somebody who seems to have had an interest in archaeological, scientific, and artistic matters, president of the Kent Archaeological Society, um, a fairly unsuccessful Tory politician, but very well connected in the court. His wife was uh, 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 somebody in the royal bedchamber of Queen Victoria, um, and it was Camden's connections, especially in the early days to Prince Albert, which facilitated close connections with the royal family, which ultimately obtained us the right to use the word royal in our title in 1866, which first becomes actually in print in 1867. Unfortunately, Camden died very suddenly after obtaining that title, so there's yet again a vacancy and yet again, Phil, it, this is the person who has become president most often, <laughs> three times, but this time under a different name. Before that, he was Baron Talbot of Malahide. He's now Baron Talbot de Malahide, 
Those of you who are experts in peerage will know the peerage, the Baron Talbot of Malahide is in the Irish peerage. It doesn't give him a seat in the House of Lords. In 1856, he was called Baron Talbot of Malahide, which is a peerage in the English peerage, and therefore he can sit in the House of Lords, which is why he's fourth baron in one case and what first baron in another. Then it's the same man, and again continued an active, um, again an active archaeological career. Camden had, act his predecessor, had set a really interesting precedent. He'd actually been consistently attending meetings in London. He presided, in one year, 1865, he presided over every one of the London meetings, something none of his predecessors had ever done before. And Talbot ha also has a pretty good record of turning up to preside at meetings other than the, the big annual meeting. And he's beginning to, as well as writing occasional papers for the journal, he is um, an active supporter and organiser. The structure that's put in place in 1863 lasts until, well, 1914. We have an annual series of events with the President who many of them, as we've seen, been continuously re-elected for long periods, accompanied by a local worthy. And if you list these, it's an unbelievably long list of earls and bishops, They're maintaining the aristocratic connection right the way through, but with one or two exceptions. Uh, I'll mention one exception in a moment, but I think in the whole of that period of 50-something years, there are only two people who would be known as Mr. Something, and then, in fact, in the terminology of the Institute, they're both Esquire. There was a big debate about whether to use Mr. or Esquire in their literature at one point in the 80s. Talbot held office, as a third time, for 17 years. And his death in 1883 gives us a sort of good point to consider how archaeology had developed in the 40 years since the Institute was founded. Some things hadn't changed. Earls and the bishops were still important as presidents of the local meetings. But more widely, a lot of change was afoot. Despite the failure of the propo earlier proposals for a Museum of National Antiquities, some progress was made. 1845, a Museums Act was passed, allowing boroughs to raise money to found museums. And a number of the more enlightened um, boroughs, um, places like Ipswich and Leicester, very soon used that opportunity to fund borough, borough organized museums which raised the profile of archaeology locally. And the beginnings of legislation for monuments um, took place, not ancient monuments in the sense of field monuments, but um, in 1845 an act of vandalism saw the smashing of the Portland vase in the British Museum, one of the main pieces of Roman glassware. Uh, it was smashed possibly as, a as an act of terrorist vandalism by an Irishman, or maybe just deranged vandalism. It, it, whether it was a terrorist act was debated. Um, by a quirk of English law, the legal status of a museum object was unclear, so that the person who did it was convicted of smashing the glass case, not its contents, which resulted in the, the first passing of historic one, uh, historic object legislation, uh, the, the Act for the Preservation of Works of Art and Scientific and Literary Collections. Um, a few years later, another act, there'd been another act of uh, an outbreak of vandalism in London, um, damaging the statues of royalty, which was clearly intolerable and led to the 1854 Public Statues Act, preserving. Pre pre preserving uh, public statues, especially those of royalty, and, and creating government powers of authority over them. Um, British Museum actually started displaying objects. In 1849, Duke of Northumberland presented the what we now call the Stanley Hoard or the Nelsonby Hoard, iron age metalwork, uh, 
to the British Museum, but only on condition that they had a room displaying British antiquities. So for the first time, they bothered to display British material. And in the reorganisation of the museum in 1866, there was a Department of British and Medieval Antiquities. So progress was being made in recognising the significance of archaeology, the importance of these collections, and the importance of public involvement in their display, and also in their protection. Another feature had been the flourishing of county societies. In some ways, the Institute may almost have been a victim of its success. One, one of Way's first ambitions was to raise the profile of archaeology, raise public awareness outside London in the importance of archaeology. Now, the foundation of museums, the beginnings of public legislation, and in particular the flourishing of county societies, many of which had many hundreds of members at annual meetings, uh, was a demonstration of this. So, in some ways, its first aim had been met within 20 years or so. So, what was its future role? Perhaps the most important development, though, is a rather more subtle one, and that is the development, perhaps one of the most important social developments in later Victorian England was the rise of professionalisation. Up until that point, the word profession had simply meant the army, the church, or the law. But from the later 19th century, we began to find the rise of professional organisations, including people like bankers and journalists, but also scientists. The word scientist is invented. It's the sort of thing that um, aristocratic presidents of the Royal Society objected to. Um, it led to, it, it was in particular, it had an effect on the organisation of scientific and academic subjects. Um, <coughs> partly a reaction to reforms of universities from the 1850s onwards, the flourishing of the public schools, the development of an educated class um, who largely interacted with themselves. Um, it's been called intellectual aristocracy and many of them married each other, so the huge networks of families, the Darwins, the Trevelyans, the Macaulays, uh, the Wedgwoods, all of these intermarry, and so you can find a network of intermarried people. Um, Archaeology is on the fringes of this. Albert Way himself, when he started with, married Emmeline Stanley, who was the daughter of Baron Stanley. The, uh, the Stanleys were a, a fairly the younger branch of the big Stanley family who became the Earls of Derby and major landowners in Lancashire. Uh, but they had some important people, and, and not just landowners, but prominent scientists, thinkers, and so on. So um, Albert Way is, by marriage, the uncle of General Pitt Rivers and the great uncle of the philosopher Bertrand Russell. So, and we can find other networks of relationships. Archaeology is just on the fringe of this intellectual aristocracy. But archaeology as a profession was quite slow. It's nowhere near the speed of the physical scientists or the engineers in developing professional organisation and professional standards. Despite the foundation of museums, there are few professional curatorial posts outside the British Museum. Most leading archaeologists of the late 19th century are still wealthy amateurs. So certainly in prehistory, if you take the major names, John Evans to John Lubbock, General Pitt Rivers, these are all people wealthy, from wealthy backgrounds, also wealthy, wealthy jobs in manufacturing industry or in, um, bank, in banking, in particular in Lubbock's case. Um, even somebody, one of the, I think, you know, the, another of that group of famous but important developing archaeologists, Augustus Austin Franks, who was the first curator of British antiquities in the British Museum, came from a wealthy background and refused to take a salary because he didn't want anybody to think he needed the job for the money. Even university posts were quite late and the first professorial posts being founded in the 1870s onwards were in classical archaeology, Greek, Latin, Greek, Roman, and Egyptian archaeology. It wasn't until much later 
even until the 1920s, that begin to get posts in a wider range of academic posts. But other things were happening, especially at the end of the century. The Victoria County History Series was started in 1899, providing opportunities for professional historians to write, not just about history, but about the archaeology of their counties. The Inspectorate of Ancient Monuments within the Office of Works had been founded for Pitt River, Pit Rivers. It, it lapsed when he died in 1900, but it was revived in 1910 under Charles Piers. Royal Commissions, the Royal Commissions of Ancient Historical Monuments, um, started in 1907 and 1908, initially using a lot of staff from the Victoria County History Stable. So from soon after, well, from around the turn of the century, there begins to be a rather larger and rather more professional group who are working at some form of archaeology. How had this affected the RAI? Well, initially, some interesting responses. The original purpose of the Central Committee in London had been to receive and process information and to publish it in the journal, which was published in quarterly segments, large quantities of art short articles and a large quantity of what they called archaeological intelligence, which was new discoveries. After two or three years, they realized this was an ineffective use of their time, and they opened the London meetings of the Central Committee to all members. So there was something for a president to preside over, even though many of them didn't. But it created a further bias towards London. Meetings were in London. And the, se the session of eight or so meetings, roughly October or November through to June, July, was started, I think, in 1846. And we're still doing it. But it created that tension between a London-based operation and its relationship to the wider world. This was in some way made a bit worse. Um, from the, There's an initial experiment in the 1870s, but from the early 1900s onwards, the Institute develops a spring and an autumn meeting. By 1910, we had the spring meeting, the autumn meeting, the big summer meeting, and a series of lectures in London. Um, it's, a, it's a program of events that has not changed for the last 107 years. But again, the, sp the spring and summer meetings, the spring and autumn meetings, as originally advised, were intended for London members, non-residential, so they could just go on a day trip or uh, two days looking at monuments. Um, perhaps a recognition that the majority of their members were already in London, um, but providing additional um, events for them, but again, increasing the balance of the activities focused on London and raising the question of what was the presence of the Institute outside London other than its annual summer. The annual meeting now calls the summer meeting because there's spring and autumn meetings to compete with it. So the annual meeting becomes the summer meeting. The London presence becomes a problem. The Institute moved regularly. It, the premises were getting larger and larger as it acquired more stuff. And in the hundred or no, in the in the sixty or so years that it had premises in London, it had at least six different locations by the end of the case. So it moved fairly regularly, each move was costly, and the premises themselves were expensive to lease, to maintain, and to furnish. It had not just offices for its employed sec um, secretary administrator, it had a meeting room, it had a library, it had a museum, it accumulated antiquities which were regularly given to it, which it didn't have the courage to reject. And this caused financial pressure 
on the upkeep and maintenance of the rooms needed. In one annual report, the library is referred to as that great encumbrance. I suspect that they had a large room with three and a half thousand volumes and virtually nobody reading it. They'd solved part of the problem earlier on by donating a large part of their antiquities to the British Museum. And finally, in the 1890s, they bit the bullet and realised that they could not go on doing all of this. But it was the financial pressure. Uh, in one year, they'd had to sell their entire capital investment to pay the printer's bill. And somebody realised you could not go on doing that and existing on occasional donations from wealthy, sympathetic supporters. And with much opposition, the library and the remaining antiquities were disposed of. Part of the library was donated to the antiquaries, you'll find it upstairs, resulting in the arrangement for members of the institute to use the antiquaries library. Those things which were duplicates or unwanted by the antiquaries were sold, along with the remaining antiquities, for a sum of over £500 uh, in, in the 1890, late 1890s. If you convert that to modern money, it's difficult, it could be anywhere between about forty and £80,000. Um, it was the basis of the financial security of the Institute for years to come. Um, many people regarded getting rid of a library as a sort of cultural vandalism, but it was, it was forced on them, but ultimately it was a realistic assessment of what the Institute should be doing and spending money on a library which duplicated what was in the antiquaries and was grossly unused was not the best use of their money. One of the consequences of selling it was a capital sum which made the Institute largely successful. The, the, the references to constant financial problems disappear. There are still complaints about the number of members who are in arrears. But the actual the fact that the comments on financial crises rare. It also enabled the Institute to set up a research fund. They had the money, to, the opportunity to give money away for the first time. Uh, initially it was designed to promote excavations on sites they were going to visit at the summer meeting. So it was a research fund promoting research which they would then visit and disseminate through their annual reports, which seems almost like joined up thinking. I think it was an accident, but it, was, it looks like it. We see a couple of sort of in, in illustrations of the changing times as well. When Talbot died, they had to find a successor. There was considerable support for an invitation to go to Sir John Lubbock, one of the lead, the later Lord Avery, one of the leading archaeologists of the period who'd previously been president of the Anthropological um, Society. Strong opposition from some members of council who insisted that it should be an aristocrat, not a distinguished archaeologist and a mere knight. Lubbock was invited and refused. Uh, it's not quite clear why he refused whether he was too busy, whether he objected to being asked to be a president of anybody which thought like that or what, but he didn't become president and the invitation went to somebody else, as we'll see in a minute. Among the serried ranks of earls and bishops that we see as presidents of the meeting, there's one very different name, and that is General Pitt Rivers a real archaeologist who actually had something interesting to say in the address by the president of the meeting, who presided at Salisbury in 1887 and again at Dorchester in 1897, before they reverted to earls and bishops. But an interesting sign of the changing recognition of a professional archaeologist. Or the, uh, Pitt Rivers wasn't really a professional archaeologist, but he just knew as we got to it at that point. But if you want to a visual demonstration of the changing times, compare 
two of our volumes. If you compare the volume for 1905 with the volume for 1910, you'll see an incredible difference, in particular in the way they were reporting the annual meeting. 1905, the main emphasis was on all the civic dignitaries who turned out to welcome the Institute with long lists of mayors and so on, and a full, uh, full text of the verbose orations that they gave each other, and then fairly brief accounts of what they went to see. By 1910, this had changed completely. The list of dignitaries and the dose record, record of orations had gone. One line, the, the meeting opened on, whatever. For a, a complete change of typeface as well, followed by very detailed architectural presentations with some extraordinarily high quality graphics and site plans. Um, it may be that it's the work of organisations like the Royal Commission and Victoria County History, which had simply raised the standard of scholarship. But the Institute's summer reports are a very visual demonstration of something like modern archaeology hitting the Institute between 1905 and 1910. Go back to our presidents. Um, the, instead of Lubbock, they um, asked Earl Percy, who was the heir to the Duke of Northumberland, a conservative politician. You have a long line of conservative politicians. Many of them have got fair, fairly predictable backgrounds. Uh, Eton and Trinity College, Cambridge, appears in quite a lot of CVs of presidents. Um, uh, he presided over one meeting in Newcastle where he introduced the biggest worthy of the region, the Duke of Northumberland, who was, of course, his father. Succeeded by another Irish landowning, member of the Irish landowning family, Viscount Dillon, a, a very interesting character who did have an army career, but then became an authority on history of arms and, and armour. And again, um, fulfilled a number of offices in the the academic and artistic world, um, presided over the Institute for six years, resigned as he became president of the Antiquaries. And succeeded by Sir Henry Howarth, who has, I think, the distinction of being, or two, two distinctions, First of all, he is the president who served the longest continual period of office of 25 years, and he's probably the least known president in our history. Um, now, you may think that's a suitable mem a memorial to him. He was a wealthy barrister, an MP, but uh, made little impact in the House. Uh, he was an argumentative, controversialist, carried out most of his politics by writing angry letters to the Times, but he did have an interest in history, archaeology, ethnography, geography. Um, he wrote a long history, of, a three-volume history of the Mongols, which was apparently well-received. Um, late in life, he turned his attention to Anglo-Saxon England, and I'm reliably assured that his legacy for Anglo-Saxon scholarship is vanishingly small, if not zero. <laughs> But um, he also was interested in geology and was perfectly convinced of his own rightness in rejecting a theory of ice ages and claiming that all these changes were due to a series of um, really serious flooding episodes. Um, needless to say, it, it got no support from the geological world, but nothing would convince him he was wrong. But he, again, was a reliable, assiduous presider over events, attended and presided over most of the meetings, and saw the Institute through the First World War, which was no mean achievement. The, the, the meetings continued. If you look at the journal, you will find volumes in 1914, 15, 16, etc. Um, don't believe it. They were not published in those years. When we got to 1920, the Institute was six years behind publication, and it took most of the 1920s to catch up, largely through the efforts of people like Mortimer Wheeler, who became editor. But how for all his uh, idiosyncratic ideas, was a loyal supporter of the Institute um, and saw it through difficult times. On his death, we enter what I, I call phase three of the presidents. 
you find the first professional academic, Professor Boyd Dawkins, a distinguished geologist, a professor of geology at Manchester, but also an expert on early human occupation of Britain, a cave archaeology as well as his geological work. Um, as a distinction, firstly, he was the first academic professional to hold office, a sign of changing times, the rise of the aristocracy, the intellectual aristocracy. He was also the oldest. I think he was 83 when he took up office. Three years later, he offered his sadly offered his resignation on the grounds of advancing years but he had been a regular attender and vice president and contributed to a lot of the summer meetings a few years earlier. And now we move into a series of, a recognizably modern series of academic professionals, not necessarily strictly archeologists. Boyd Dawkins was mainly a geologist interested in archeology, span followed by Sir Charles Oman, a military historian. But the boundaries between history and architectural history, medieval history are difficult to draw. He was very interested in military architecture as well as being uh, a historian and numismatist. And he was succeeded by Alexander Hamilton Thompson, again a medieval expert, started out as a literary scholar but also a an expert on medieval architecture. Um, he was First, the first employee at Armstrong College Newcastle, the forerunner of modern Newcastle University, and very briefly actually held the title of Reader in Medieval History and Medieval Archaeology, before moving to Leeds, where he became just Professor of History, Medieval History. Probably, I, I think, the only person to be president of both the Archaeological Institute and its other half, the British Archaeological Association. And he did that both at the same time, <laughs> during, during the Second World War. Again, somebody was needed to keep the Institute going uh, and the association going through difficult times. Yeah, not no, I didn't mention that here. Succeeded by Sir Alfred Clapham, uh, another architectural historian who worked for the VCH and then worked for the Royal Commission, becoming its secretary and then commission, and also at some point president of the Society of Antiquities. And he, he it was, I think, who gave the first presidential lecture other than a, a, a welcoming oration at, at a summer meeting. I will come back to that in just one moment. At that point, I'm going to stop the, the individuals. It's, uh, since Boyd Dawkins, as the first academic professional, including him and myself, there have been 28 presidents, almost all, apart from Hamilton Thompson, serving three years and then leaving for a successor. So we have 28 presidents. Uh, this is a very rough and ready calculation of their disciplinary interests. Um, of course, we are all interested in all periods, but we're known particularly as specialising in one. This is a very crude breakdown. Um, the two prehistorians that I think are Boyd Dawkins and myself. Otherwise, we have been dominated by medievalists, Romans and medievalists. Um, maybe the public perception that we are a body that deals with medieval things is not misplaced. I, I'm not sure I can offer any explanation for this. I present it as a fact. If we then look at their institutional affiliation, this is even harder. Uh, because um, many people worked in more than one sector. Uh, Mortimer Wheeler, for instance, started in the Royal Commission, then worked in museums, then worked in university. He spans uh, the university. Public, by public service, I mean national organisations like the Office of Works, Ministry of Public Works, Historic Scotland, or whatever. Um, dominated, perhaps, by universities. Um, the other... Um, at Le Joan, Joan Evans was president in... 1948 to 51, I think, something like that. Um, she described herself as the last amateur president. She had a wealthy private income. Um, but was she? How do you classify somebody like Harold Taylor, who was 
a, a uni by profession, or by training, a scientist, but became a university administrator and vice chancellor. But as an expert on Anglo-Saxon architecture, he was not an archaeologist. He never had an academic post in archaeology. So I, I put him down at university, but he might have been an other because he, he might have been the last amateur in the sense of not professionally employed in archaeology. Um, does this in any way reflect the modern status of archaeology? Well, certainly not for the last 20 years or so, uh, where university, museum, and public service sector have shrunk from the position of dominating about 60% of posts in archaeology to the current position where they occupy about 15%. There are large parts of the archaeological world which have not been represented in the hierarchy of the Institute. To return to the question of the presidential lecture um, and to what I was saying earlier, the first lecture by a president that I can determine was Alfred Clapham in 1948 who gave a lecture at the event following the AGM. What that was deemed to be an ordinary meeting. His role as president had lapsed a few minutes earlier at the AGM, and the annual report for the year quite rightly declares that it's a lecture by Sir Alfred Clapham, past president. <laughs> so since then, the tradition of presidents giving three lectures has they have in their third year they have masqueraded illegally as president <laughs> when their term of office had quite clearly lapsed a few minutes earlier. So if I'm asked to do a president's lecture next year, I shall refuse on the grounds that I will not be president. <laughs> to be serious for a moment, what have I learned from this? First of all, uh, a mild digression. There are all sorts of amusing, interesting and exotic things in the records. Um, constant references to financial crises, selling up the entire capital fund, uh, the annual or regular complaints about the amount of uh, uh, the number of members who are in arrears, fluctuating number of members, things that we've lived with, we, we've lived with for 150 years. There are some good things. Uh, one of the most interesting things was the willingness of members to come to the aid of the institute with financial donations at times of hardship. <laughs> There are some practices we would certainly like to promote and to maintain. On the other hand, in the 1880s, I think, there was long discussion about ill discipline at the annual meeting, uh, which again, probably, uh, the annual meeting in those days were not just restricted to members, they were open to non-members. And I suspect that this is a complaint by certain council members about too many people of the wrong sort being allowed into the annual meeting. But the council did debate quite strenuous uh, methods, including um, the use of bugles and whippers in to, ma to maintain public order at our annual meetings. Um, I haven't yet been to an annual meeting which needed that sort. Um, prevailing impression, Institute has at times been very quick to respond. Certainly in the early years, the opening up of the London meetings, the changing in the nature of the presidency, uh, with occasional lapses, they've, they've responded quite rapidly. When forced into change, it's largely been due to short-term financial pressure. They sold the library because they couldn't afford it, not because they considered rationally whether that was the best use of their money. Fortunately, it gave them a capital reserve which allowed them to do things afterwards. balance between the London-centric nature and the relationships with the, what might call the provinces, the non-London members, has not really been resolved. As I said before, the, the fundamental nature of our activities has not changed since 1910. And I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or not. In fact, in, what innovations have happened since 1910 well, we started a newsletter. We started the president's lecture, or the past president's lecture. 
but it's difficult to think of much else. And I think there are serious lessons for us as an institute. We're in the fortunate position of having a membership and being reasonably solvent, having a good reputation. But archaeology has changed enormously in the last 20 years, and I think the institute needs to contemplate whether it has actually changed its own activities and its own nature sufficiently to keep up with the modern state of archaeology as it was doing in the early 20 or 30, 20 or 30 years of its existence. I think it's rather a sombre note, but I think we, we, the whole point of studying the history of the organisation is to try and learn from it and to see how we can use that to improve our own performance as an institute in the future. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I, I don't know whether it was a long-term institution, but another valuable institution is I can ask, invite you to join us for a glass of wine outside. Thank you very much indeed for, and I should, I don't know if I'm invited for next year's, but I should be back. You're on the list of the I'm on the, the secretary tells me on the list, so I look forward to speaking to you again in a year's time, in whatever capacity. Thank you very much for your attention.